Yeah. All right. Day 11. Recession proof your finances in 30 days. Getting ready for what's coming. So I'm Peter Dunn, Pete the Planner, CEO of Hey Money. Today we're going to walk you through 20 minutes or so of fixed expenses and your financial vices. That is what is happening. Appreciate my man, Mr. Kinetic, with the music. This entire project, he's always my man. He does my radio show, my podcast, and all that other stuff. I now list my age as has his own DJ. Not really, just a friend. But uh, hey, welcome back, everybody. A lot going on. Breaking news throughout the night as the Senate confirmed, uh, and by confirmed, I mean voted and passed, the stimulus package, which now goes to the House of Representatives tomorrow, Friday, and hopefully gets uh, going here in the next few weeks. So we're going to start our time here together talking about that, a little bit more about what's in the bill, specifically around unemployment benefits, some student loan benefits, some other factors. And we're also going to talk uh, here about the market because it's doing some wild things. Let's go ahead and start there. As you know, there are three things we're dealing with. We have to cover this every time because it's just a good reminder. Number one, there's the virus. I have no thoughts on that other than I listen to scientists. You know what I always say there. Number two, there's the stock market. Number three, there's the economy. Those two things are different. They are related in certain ways and we have to understand those ways. But more than anything, the takeaway should always be don't let the stock market distract you. Now, when the stock market is doing very poorly, like it was last week, uh, that's very important because it can make you feel real bad. And when it's done what it's done over the last three days and gone up nearly 20%, then you also have to check yourself and you have to say, look, um, not all of this is fixed. The market is going up for whatever reasons it's going up. I think a lot of it has to do with the stimulus. Part of it had to do with the jobs report that was this morning. The jobless claims report came out uh, taking a look at how many jobless claims were filed in the last week. The week prior, it was about 220,000 Americans had jobless claims. This past week, just under 3.3 million Americans have filed for unemployment. Now, that's not exactly accurate because there are other people who have filed, who have been denied for various reasons. So the number arguably could be closer to 5 million people right now and that number will continue to climb next week and into the coming weeks what's unique and interesting and what you need to know about this if we really distill it for you is that the market priced this in well, what does that mean we're gonna learn some stuff today it means the market has gone up the market has already considered that there would be a very huge unemployment number this morning and because the number wasn't bigger than what was priced in the market continued to flourish. At one point today, the market was up well over a thousand points as measured by the Dow Jones Industrial Averages. And despite the fact that I'm talking about this right now, I don't want this to distract you. It's really easy to feel good about things that don't matter. And also arguably to feel bad about things that don't matter. The stock market as it relates to our current problem right now, doesn't matter. It is freaking people out or getting people too excited for no reason. Back to the economy. Let's talk about the stimulus bill and uh, some of the impact it may have. Uh, the stimulus payments themselves, we covered those yesterday. I don't have a lot more comments for you there other than these will be direct deposited into the bank accounts that are associated with your last tax filing. If you have a refund and, or you make payments and you have a, a checking account or savings account attached to those payments with the IRS, that is where the check will be deposited. If you do not have an account on file with the Internal Revenue Service, I have bad news to deliver to you. It's going to take up to four months to get a live check. And that's a problem because that doesn't really stimulate anything. and doesn't actually really help, especially if you're hurting and unemployed right now. If you do have an account on file and you qualify for the stimulus payments, you should, according to uh, Secretary of the Treasury, Steve Mnuchin, you should have your payment within three weeks, which is a little sooner than I thought, but we'll see. We'll see. It doesn't always go as quickly as we'd like. It's also important to know with the unemployment benefits, there's some enhanced unemployment benefits that do some pretty interesting things. If you happen to be in the gig economy, which I'm worried about those folks as much as anybody, with the passage of this stimulus package, you should be able to qualify for unemployment benefits. And generally you wouldn't 
This is part of the enhancement. The other thing is for four months, you'll get an additional $600 per week on top of what else, uh, whatever else your unemployment benefit was going to be. For some people, oddly enough, this will be a little bit of a raise from what they were making when they were working. Some are concerned that that's going to disincentivize people from going back to work. I happen to not hold that particular viewpoint for a few different reasons. One of which is that people will be unemployed for a few weeks before they get uh, some payment in the form of unemployment insurance. And so they're already in the hole. Number two, if the unemployment numbers are as going to be as ugly as we think they will be, this isn't a matter of disincentivizing someone from working. This is a matter of there are no jobs to go work because the economy is not open yet. And number three, and this is a tough one for people to understand, it's not like everyone who lost their job was on the low side of the income scale. There's a lot of people who made a lot of money who lost their job. So even with this $600 enhancement, they will uh, take a pay cut, even though that $600 a week for four months is very generous. I was reading an article in the Financial Times this morning. It's the pink newspaper for those that know. It's true. It's actually printed in pink. And they're, one of their um, headlines was talking about the idea that uh, in, in America, right, it's an international newspaper, in America, uh, the unemployment insurance is kept purposefully low to curb laziness is exactly what it said. That was a bit on the nose. I don't really think any of us are being lazy right now. We just can't work, right? We collectively, I'm working right now, but you know what I mean, right? So uh, if you have questions about what is in the stimulus package and you can't decipher it yourself, feel free to just leave a comment here in the section, um, in, in the comments on Facebook, or if you're watching this on YouTube, you can do the same and I'll do my best to jump in there and answer it. One last note about the stimulus package that has me a bit concerned. If you've been part of a divorce proceeding, or I like to say relationship transition, uh, over the last couple of years, and your last tax filing has you filing together, and you are now separate, I'm a little bit concerned that the person that has maintained control of the account that the IRS will deposit the money in uh, is going to be forced to um, make a tough and important decision. Ideally, they share what is the other person's part of the stimulus with, with that person. We all know that not every relationship ends on such a sour note that people don't talk and aren't cordial. If that's the case and you are cordial, by all means, get the appropriate dollars in the appropriate person's hands. That includes the $500 payments for children that are involved. My biggest fear, though, in regards to this topic is that people who uh, aren't so cordial, that aren't talking, may... Uh, make some poor decisions around that money. Now, I'm not going to pull the morality card on you, but I think at this time in human history where we need as much humanity as possible, I'd like to encourage you without judgment to do the right thing and get that money into the hands of the appropriate person, no matter the current state of your relationship. All right, off the soapbox. Uh, if you've just joined us for the first time today, you're thinking, wow, that guy's not very fun. By the way, I'm wearing my Oklahoma City uh, Thunder shirt today. Why? Well, I'm a Pacers fan, so it's I'm wearing this because of the Tiger King, and I wanted to feel connected with the state of Oklahoma. If we have any Oklahomans, uh, I think that's how you say it, Sooners? I don't know, uh, viewing this program right now, shout out to you and your, your native son, the Tiger King. Okay, if you don't know what I'm talking about, I can't help you. All right, so the point of this program, this 30-day program on which we are on day 11 is to cut at least $500 a month, and we are going to get after that today. Uh, another part that, that I've been teasing this entire time, and it may mean nothing to you until today, is this concept of pressing reset. I'm of the belief that sometimes we look at our financial lives and they feel put upon us. They feel assigned to us as opposed to personal selections that we've made. And it's because of that, in an opportunity like this, we can go and restructure some of the decisions we've made, essentially pressing reset and cutting expenses in the process. And finally, we want you to stop guessing. I think most people's financial strategy includes crossing their fingers and to make sure they're well crossed so that uh, it doesn't look weird. Stop guessing. Hope is interesting. Hope is interesting. It's not a financial strategy, but it's an interesting concept. Uh, too often, people hope their financial lives work out. People do need luck. I believe in luck. I used to not believe in luck, but I realize that we all don't have the same 
uh, chances financially in life because we are raised in different environments. So uh, those are the three goals of the program. If you want personal assistance, as many of you have reached out and done, uh, for those that haven't, go to callheymoney.com. Someone from our team will help walk you through all of this. They will help you rebuild your financial life. It is a very unique service. It's 20 bucks a month. You're paired with a, an expert, a certified financial planner or an accredited financial counselor. And you can even use the discount code cheese. I don't know why. Cheese. All right, let's get after it. We're talking two things today, fixed expenses and vices. Next week is budgeting week. We've, we've sort of teased that for you. Uh, but I do want to talk about fixed expenses from a structural standpoint today. You'll see what I mean in just un momento. And bilingual. And then we're also going to talk about financial vices. This is interesting because I think they're starting to unravel a little bit in an economy like this. Uh, it's okay that all of us have a certain thing, a certain liberty we take in our spending where it seems like it makes sense. For instance, for instance, Joe Exotic, the Tiger King, loved to spend money on tigers, right? That's his vice. Maybe your vice is a cigar. Maybe your vice is online shopping. Amazon, whatever. We'll talk about that. We'll talk about how to identify it and what it means uh, in me uh, relation to reshaping your financial life. So let's talk about obligations. Obligations. I want to take you back to a moment in your life. We're going to call it your 20s. If you're just watching this right now and you have yet to achieve your 20s, welcome. Uh, if you are currently in your 20s, please understand that someday you will feel differently than you feel right now. For those that used to be in their 20s, do you remember when you were in your 20s and you likely, early 20s, had fewer obligations than you do in your financial life right now? It's not meant to be or sound condescending to people in their 20s, but as a 42-year-old bald Midwesterner who's got the body of a mathlete, it's a very mathletic build. Anyway, uh, as a 42-year-old, I can tell you my financial life was a heck of a lot simpler 20 years ago. Oh, man. I would argue that we probably had half, if not 70% uh, less obligations from a, a number standpoint than we do right now. Kids contribute to that. Lifestyle creep uh, contributes to that. All sorts of things contribute to that. So we're going to we're going to dig into that today because ideally what we want to do is if you've got a big pile of obligations, if you've got 25 fixed expenses a month, yes, we want to trim those expenses from a dollar standpoint, but some of those expenses we want to go away totally. As I look out the window of my home office, I see my kids staring out the window at me, properly socially distancing themselves from the neighborhood kids trying to distract me, but fortunately they didn't distract me. We need to cut the obligations, not just from a dollars and cents standpoint, but a, 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 a number, a volume standpoint. Here's what I mean. All right. For instance, let's talk about housing. You know, whether you have a mortgage payment or rent, that is the first obligation you have. On budgeting week, we're going to talk about the percentages that that should be. But right now, what we're talking about is the fact that you have one. You either have a mortgage payment or you have a rent payment. Utilities. Now, this, this is wide ranging. Utilities can be anything from uh, gas and electric and water and waste. I mean, you can even begin to add in uh, cable or satellite or data services. You know, we're going to talk about digital home services here in a second, which include data plans, cell phones, Netflix, Hulu, Disney Plus. HBO, Showtime, just keep adding them on, right? YouTube plus or live, whatever. I'm sounding like an old guy. I don't know what any of these things are, right? So there's a lot of utility. So if you if you have a pen or a pencil or something to write with near you and something to write on, uh, maybe just count up what you have. So if mark down one tick mark if you've got a home payment or of some sort, mortgage payment or rent, and then start counting up your utilities, a tick mark for each one of these. Uh, guess electric, water, waste, maybe a home owner's association, something like that, garbage. And then you also got to look at regular maintenance for your home. Maybe you have a lawn service or a landscaping service or a window washer. I mean, I, I know a window washer. 
And now I, as a fairness, I don't actually know who one, anyone that has their windows washed at their home. I could probably wash my own windows, but I don't know. Does anyone care about this topic? No, let's move on. There's other maintenance topics as well that, that really get grouped in. I think the point on this screen, especially screen, when you get down to the digital home to things as well, I mean, you could look at 15 different fixed expenses right here. Think about 15 years ago. Did you have 15 fixed expenses in relation to housing alone 15 years ago? No, no, you didn't. And see, what happens is you just assume that this is the way it is, and this is the way it should be, this is the way it will always be, and you're already comfortable with the fact that more obligations will add to that. That's where you get in trouble, because in your early 20s, you don't have many obligations. Maybe you have rent, maybe a couple utilities that aren't included in rent, you've got car insurance, a car maybe if you're not using mass transit, student loan payment, and those are your fixed expenses for like four or five. You can have 20 or 25 now if you're in your 40s or 50s. And quickly, you will realize that financial independence, aka retirement, can happen when you cut these obligations. So prior to this crisis we're in right now, there's this strange belief in our country that people believe they will be able to successfully retire because they will have a lot of money. I, and they will just do it like this. Someday I will retire and I'll be able to retire because I'll have a bunch of money. Okay, that seems reasonable in nature, but most people, this is what I do, let me tell you, most people will successfully retire not because they have a lot of money. It's because they don't need a lot of money. Now, this isn't semantics. I'm not trying to be cute about it. I'm simply suggesting that not needing a lot of money by curbing your obligations as you age is a much smarter way at a successful retirement as opposed to having a lot of money. Of course, some of you have already done the math on this. If you control your increase in obligations in your 40s, 50s, and early 60s, then you will in fact not need a lot of money and also have a lot of money. But if your goal alone is to have a lot of money and you don't do it by not needing a lot of money, you're in trouble. Here's a mathematical example. Let's say I, let's say I save 10% of my income right now. That means I am dependent on 90% of my income. Okay, so there's some pretty, pretty middle school, if not elementary school math here. If I'm using 90% of my income and I'm saving 10% of my income and you add them together, that's 100% of my income. Now, next year, if I'm making an effort to live on less, to not need a lot of money, that means I will increase the amount of money I save to let's say 11%. Therefore, instead of being dependent on 90% of my income, I'm, in, I'm dependent on 89% of my income. That is the process of financial independence. We will get into the dollars and cents of this next week, but right now I just need you to understand the concept and that the idea by cutting specific obligations is the way to do it. Let's talk about uh, transportation. I don't know how many uh, obligations you have in the form of transportation in your house. I know one of my neighbors has four cars. I know that. I have no reason to think they do or don't have car payments, but can you imagine if they had four car payments car insurance, uh, and even like your monthly car washes or something like that, you're talking six obligations in the transportation department. Uh, we don't happen to have any car payments and we have an insurance payment and that's it. And we don't have regular maintenance pay payments on our vehicles, despite the fact that we do regular maintenance. We don't have monthly maintenance, I should say. So in that particular category, you can have one or two things, or if you're out of control, you could have four or five and that's disconcerting, right? Those are unnecessary obligations. That's why when people say, well, my car payment's just two to $300 a month, uh, when you view it in that light, which doesn't seem like much money, it is still an obligation. And if you get up every day to go to work to fund your obligations, you're not gonna create financial independence. I I've, seen every I've seen this done every which way. I remember helping a lady, oh man, 12, 11, 12 years ago, that had such a giant car payment or car payment was like 24 percent of her take-home pay just which is absurdly giant and what she was doing is she justified having this payment because she needed to get to work to earn money yet 
she was driving and paying this car payment for the right to earn money to pay for the car payment. It was like a really ugly cycle. And you got to make sure that doesn't happen to you. And it can happen very quickly. Next, let's look at some monthly obligations in terms of debt. Of course, credit card payments. If you've got five or six credit cards, each one is its own obligation. If you've got student loan payments, multiple, each one is its own obligation. If you've got medical debts, each one is its own obligation. It is worth noting though right now that federal payments, federal student loan payments will be suspended under the new stimulus package until October. Don't call your provider, log on to their website, see what the payment is due. They've already suspended them for two months, effectively immediately. But as soon as the stimulus package goes through, you will have no payments due until October. If you happen to be in public service and you're part of the public service student loan forgiveness program in order to have some of your student loans forgiven after 120 payments into the system, your, uh, your eligibility will not be threatened uh, during this time frame. So you can comfortably not make payments. Interest will not accrue. It will be forgiven during this time frame, And you can start back up in October when you get back on your feet. If you want to continue to make payments during this time frame, go right ahead. But it is a nice sense of relief, which is very helpful. This is also the reason I don't like people to have debt. There are some financial experts that are like, you know, debt is evil. You know, certain uh, historical and, and, and mystical and biblical works will tell you that debt is evil. I don't necessarily care about any of that other than to say it's an obligation. If you have five credit cards, three student loans, and you've got two uh, medical bills, that's 10 obligations that can be eliminated, which makes your life a lot easier. Think of it this way. When you sit down to pay bills, which is sort of an archaic nature because no one's really writing checks that much anymore. But when you sit down to pay bills, wouldn't you rather have 10 less bills to pay, absent the amount, it's just a pain in the neck? Next, insurance. I know that Mrs. Planner and I pay our health insurance uh, after we get paid. Our health insurance does not come out of our paycheck. We, we are on uh, the Affordable Care Act coverage, the marketplace. So we write a check every month, a nice healthy one that ideally we never use. That's the funny thing about insurance. And we have an insurance day coming up here soon. That's thrilling. I'm sure attendance will be through the roof. The weird thing about insurance is you want to have it, but you never want to use it. And then yet you're kind of mad you have it, but you're not. Because if you didn't need it, you'd have it. I don't know. Anyway, life insurance. Life insurance is one of those uh, obligations of love. Uh, you have life insurance, not because you personally will benefit from it, but it's because the people you love and, and care about and that depend on you will need help when you're gone because uh, you're either an income earner or you contribute to the house in some other way. Of course, the final type of insurance there can be all over the board. I mean, you can have a uh, renter's insurance. Most homeowners insurance is paid out of your mortgage payment. Of course, there's disability insurance and long-term care insurance and all sorts of other things. Finally, I think, <laughs> I think the other group of obligations are uh, subscriptions, which, you know, we've talked about on this program before. Subscriptions would be something like, uh, I subscribe to this newspaper or this magazine. Memberships can include healthcare clubs or not healthcare clubs, you know, fitness clubs or uh, things like uh, jelly of the month clubs, beer clubs, fishing tackle clubs, things like that. Or anything else you can think of. Think of pets. Pets are a monthly obligation. I mean, I realize all of our pets that we're spending all the time with right now because we're all working from home are actually therapy pets at this point in time by government decree or by Pete the Planner decree but they still are a monthly obligation. I know that seems super rude and I'm sorry, Fifi, assuming your dog's name is Fifi. Let's talk about vices. I don't think people understand that there are elements of each and each one of our financial lives that we get carte blanche. We are able to spend whatever we want in our mind on that topic because it's a big deal to us. I remember when I was a kid, my mom, my mom had these like uh, porcelain collectibles called around Christmas time called snow babies. I don't know why all these babies are out in the snow. Seems really dangerous to me, but it's a collection of these well bundled standing babies and snow arrangements. It doesn't make any sense to me either. Now that I'm really going through it, she had a bunch of them, right? Um, 
those were a bit of her device or her vice, right? She, she liked to decorate, you know, home decor is a very real vice. People love to, to treat their home as, you know, a tapestry of, of uh, the things they love. And I think that's great. But at this point in time, you have to understand you really need to get in control of your vi vice. Some of us, it's a release uh, from reality, but vices can be expensive. For instance, here's a list libations it's fancy for booze and whatnot hey in some states there's an alternative to booze that people tend to enjoy it's not my thing but whatever i know people like it so let's mention that you know <laughs> clothes some people are clothes horses i'm a clothes horse you buy a bunch of clothes i'm a shoe guy i'm a i remember at one point in time i was in this weird part of my career when i was like i'm a watch guy yeah, I'm a watch guy. I got a lot of watches. And they're all, we all through weird stages, right? It's like middle school. We, a lot of my face wasn't looking too great in middle school. It hasn't gotten that much better, but at least I don't say I'm a watch guy anymore. Music, you know, I have a really good friends, a young couple that, man, they love music. They go to concerts. They go to Coachella every year, whatever that is. They do all those sorts of things. That's very really exciting. And they spend a lot of money on it. And that's their vice. And of course, there's dining out. Right. Dining out is a is not only convenience and entertainment, as we talked about, but for a lot of people, it is a vice. In a moment of transparency, I will now share with you what my primary vice is. I enjoy wine. I mean, I enjoy whining. Not really. Actually, I don't like whining, but I like to I like wine. It's sort of it's a, it's a fun hobby, a fun thing to do. But I can tell you, as I strive to not be a hypocrite during these 30 days with you, Cutting back a little bit on the wine purchases. Don't get me wrong. I don't know if I've ever wanted to drink wine worse than right now. But we're not spending money on that. We we actually have a budget category for that. And as we talk about budgeting next week, we will talk about budgeting for your vices. Okay, that's it. That's it. We're going to get through this. I have to tell you, though, and it's really important you understand. We've had three good days in the market. Th you know, three bits of good news. The stimulus package is theoretically good news. Unemployment numbers, bad news. More bad news is coming, right? I don't want you to be discouraged when those things come along. I think you just really have to set the expectation this is going to take a while. Don't get false hope because we have two or three upticks in good news. The one thing we never talk about on this show is, you know, the virus and how it's spreading. You don't need that information from me, but you do need it from reliable sources like the CDC, Dr. Anthony Fauci, watch experts like that. And when they start to tell you it's it's slowing, the spread is slowing, the rates are coming down, then we'll have uh, an end in sight. Until then, set realistic expect expectations. And as you're discussing these things with family members or friends or people online and uh, they don't agree with you, it's okay because there's a lot of stress right now. Just understand, most people in our community want the same thing. We want the same outcome. We just have differences of opinions on how to get there, right? So if when you're discussing this with them and it's very upsetting, and we're all very upset anyway, just understand they're likely coming from a place of good intentions. They just disagree with the path. It's no different than when you and your significant other leave the house at the same time in separate vehicles to get to the same location because you needed separate cars for that event. One person goes one way, the other person goes the other way. One person will be proven right, but you both have the same thing in mind, which is just to get where you're going. So that's all I have for you today. If you want updates every morning on Twitter around 7 a.m. or so Eastern, why? Because I can't sleep. Uh, go to my Twitter feed, at Pete the Planner, and I'll try to do my best to break down what's going on in the economy. If you need something, if you want an event, you want to talk about something, just shoot me an email. Ask Pete at PeteThePlanner.com. I'll do my best to get back to you as soon as I can. Thanks so much for spending some time with me. We went 30 minutes today. Huh, must have had too much coffee. All right, have a good day.